So we switch over to Europe again. And uh, we see if you can screen, uh, share your screen. Oh. So we are with Woody. OK, Woody, you're the next one. Sounds good. Well, I think this I think my talk is just really capitalizes on just some outstanding biomechanics talks that we've heard. And um, I think that you know the 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 last portion is kind of like how do we do it based upon our understanding of SI joint biomechanics. And so um this is just I think that I'd like to start off by saying there are a lot of different ways to fuse the SI joint. And that is clear. And I think that a lot of them work really well. And it's just deciding what works best for you in your hands is uh, probably one of my take home points. But um, I'll just talk about how I do it, and um, and then we'll uh, just kind of close it up at the end for some uh, for some uh, questions. Um, it, big disclosure: uh, Mayo Clinic and I did design this system, uh, so um, there uh, I've tried to eliminate any bias, but just be clear that we designed this system. Um, we'll talk about the anatomy, especially the dysmorphic. Uh, um, sacrum just to recognize this, then my rationale, uh, and then how I do it. So I think it's clear every single patient for me gets these x-rays because I can identify subtle anatomy. We talked about sclerosis. I think uh, Dr. Stark mentioned, you know, what we see on the, the thickening of the bone and the erosions. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's recognizing the dysmorph is critical. It is a synovial joint. Um, all the talks today had a great view of what the SI joint looks like, kind of that curvilinear uh, joint kind of anteriorly. Um, this is the difference between what I would say a normal sacrum on the left and this dysmorphic sacrum on the right. And recognizing this uh, can help avoid neurovascular injury, um, especially to the L5 nerve root um, if, it's, if, uh, if it's unrecognized. So, um, I think you know, we're all familiar with the anatomy, but you know this this dysmorphic anatomy that I look at every single time because it influences how I fuse the SI joint. Are these really five critical parts to recognize on the outlet radiograph? Um, and then you can also see this acute ALR slope, especially on the lateral view on the CT scan. So that's your disc space at the top of the uh, crest. These are your residual mammillary bodies or TPs. Uh, super common, these bizarrely misshapen neural foramen, and then that residual disc space, and then the acute ALR slope. So putting that all together just really prevents complications and I think can also influence where we're putting implants, how we're putting the implants in. So my rationale, like how do I do it? These are the principles that I follow with, the, with my particular method is that we aggressively um, uh, prepare that joint, scraping out, you know, all of the a potential uh, disease cartilage and make a, a spot for auto grafting percutaneously. And then I, this is probably where I separate myself is I really believe strongly with compression. Um, and then we all agree on stability. And, uh, but I think those are the principles of, of fusion. And, you know, this is way easier than what we used to do and still do on occasion, especially for infections, are these open lateral windows where we are scraping out the SI joint aggressively. And this is morbid. Um, and so all of our methods have to be easier than this, especially for the patients to recover from. I like to get a true fusion. Um, I do some foot and ankle surgery as well. So we fuse ankles and we fuse subtalar joints. And, and uh, when you're fusing uh, some areas in the back too, we look for a solid fusion uh, across there, uh, which we know is gonna give us durable results. I also see a lot of revisions at Mayo Clinic for loose implants in the sacral ala. So this, I wanted to have a system where we could do a sound primary, but also provide a revision strategy for implants that were loose and uh, really no longer providing adequate fixation and this this looseness or the halos around implants would indicate that there's still motion. We know that you know this study you know from 09 you know, looked at intact um, uh, pelvic models and then they had you know the pubic symphysis cut, the uh, sacro spinous sacro tuberous ligaments cut. and so the SI joint in its native position, you know is uh, Dr. Raji and, and others noted throughout here is 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 strong. Um, but less and less strong as you cut ligaments. And you can also see on the left here, the synovial portion, the front, and also kind of this tongue and groove style where it's not a flat board, flat on flat. It is. It has these indolations. And I kind of talk about compression because of the tongue and groove decking for some engineers and some woodworkers here. 
I mean, you get stability by compacting and compressing these tongue and groove uh, style articulations, and that equals stability um, in my in my in my mind. We did test this, and I know that Dr. Raji has uh, he actually had a picture from our study in his talk. But we took these models, and they were intact. We destabilized them, and then we instrumented them, and then simulated some single stance load, and then we text, um, tested flexion extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation at a 7.5 newton meter force. This is the photo that he had in his talk. This is the implants that we placed in there, you know, with compression. And when you look at the results uh, from compression, you can see the intact on the left, the completely destabilized pelvic models, and then completed with compression, we were actually more stable than the intact pelvis when we looked at SI joint motion. We compared it to some predicate uh, uh, models out there, different ways to fuse the SI joints. And again, when you look at um, you know our implant here in motion, you know we were more intact than the um, or more stable than the intact pelvis. And then looking at uh, transfixation implants, adding the compressive force. Um, was more stable than um, other models out there. Um, so how do I do it based upon, you know, some of that data? My, these are, this is my criteria, like who do I operate on? They have to have those four criteria in blue, and then uh, they have to have failed everything non-op. And then, you know, as I said at the beginning, there are a lot of methods out there. Choose which one you like and what gives you the best results. My technique is uh, highly predicated on a perfect template, making sure I don't injure, you know, specifically L5 coming over the brim or S1. Uh, here's L5 up above and S1 down below, navigating right between there, just using biplanar fluoroscopy in my hands. And um, I put the patients prone. Um, there's the PSIS, mid-axis to the femur. So that's typically the standard starting point. That's how the sacrum's resting on there. And I use inlet views and outlet views primarily. There's my inlet view where I'm uh, doing anterior and posterior corrections, looking right down one on two. And then the outlet view where we're going to go cranial and caudal. And that's the sacrum there. And I'm going to go uh, adjust my image to go cranial or caudal there. And then if I'm a little bit confused or to dysmorph, I get a lateral view to make sure I'm behind the iliac cortical density and I'm within the body of that appropriate vertebral segment, typically S1. Um, there are we. I have videoed this. It's on YouTube if you want to wa watch how we do this. Um, I have a, do a couple different uh, um, examples of how, of how I do this. There's only two critical steps for this whole procedure, I think, and that's just placing the pin safely. Um, if you're if we're unfamiliar with uh, biplanar fluoroscopy, you can navigate this in using a variety of different navigation systems. Then I also think it's key to make sure you're in the SI joint so you can completely decorticate it and uh, and obtain some bone graft from that area to re-inject. The pin placement, I like to go perpendicular to that SI joint axis so that when we compress the SI joint, it is not providing any type of shear effect. It's that we're compressing it along its uh, native plane. Um, and then we aggressively decorticate it. So we go back and forth and back and forth with this. It's just a wheel and decorticates this. Um, I try not to come out the front. And then we're able to apply some bone graft here, which is a mixture of auto graft from the drill harvest and from the decortication step. And when you inject this uh, bone graft, it goes in the uh, cancellous bone and allows you to achieve a fusion um, between those two joints uh, or between the two bones to, to really give us a, a long-term durable uh, result. Um, so I think this I think that's why a lot of our patients, you know, for a variety of different methods, again, are getting really instantaneous relief the next day or even that evening. It's because of that compression and instant stability. For my procedure, um, all patients that are weight bearing is tolerated immediately post op. They use crutches, maybe just for their buttocks pain, and then just standard follow ups uh, uh, after that. So um, that's sort of how I do it based upon the biomechanics. Um, it's a plug for our upcoming meeting this September in Graz. Um, but uh, that's, I'd love to answer any questions people have about it. Um, but uh, that's kind of how I do it based upon biomechanics.